uh, back in the early 1980s, the federal government uh, decided that it was going to change the way the consumer price index uh, was calculated because inflation was rising uh, more rapidly than they wanted to see. And it meant that they had to have uh, higher cost of living adjustments in the year ahead uh, for people on Social Security. Um, with the effect that if they could somehow bring down the reported CPI, it would reduce the uh, cost of living adjustments that they would they would have to make. And um, I, I took offense at that because the whole concept of the consumer price index was to measure constant standard of living and give people an honest adjustment to their social security payments or anything else that the government uh, paid out. So when they, they started uh, changing it, and before 1980, it was, it was pretty stable and consistent. Uh, after 1980, the, uh, the biggest change was they uh, looked at uh, housing and where there had been a component in the housing cost reflecting the cost of owning your own home. They changed that to the concept of a new concept of new home, uh, homeowners equivalent rent, where the government would estimate how much it cost you to rent your own house. And then the uh, monthly inflation rate was determined by how much the government determined that the homeowner would raise uh, the his rental rate on himself. Completely nonsense number, but it had the effect of knocking something like one and a half percentage points off the uh, aggregate CPI. And there were other changes made after that uh, into the early 2000s. And if you look at the, uh, what I did was just try to reverse engineer the changes that the government made. And over time, uh, allowing for things to pretty much stabilize in the 2000, uh, the, the year, the 2000 uh, year frame, 2000 to 2010, um, that the uh, right now you're looking at a, an actual CPI that is uh, closer to seven or eight percent above what the government's reporting. So the government's yeah. reporting seven percent on headline inflation, and you're saying we're at 15 percent. Well, if you look at the uh, latest numbers, this would be for uh, December. Uh, the government's headline uh, 7.0 percent, yeah, uh, which is the highest in 40 years, would yeah. have been 15.1 percent, uh, based on my estimation, which would make it the highest since 1947, when Harry Truman was president. I'm 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 looking at the CPI the same way it was estimated before that they started uh, changing the the the, the approach in uh, the 1980s. So why the underreporting by the government? You think? It was deliberate. They, they changed the methodologies to reduce the headline reporting. In other words, we're one of the, the biggest, I think. The but why biggest, would they do that? What's the incentive? What's the political incentive to do that? The, the, the political incentive, very simply, was to reduce government outlays in terms of uh, cost of living adjustments. Significant. I mean, people on Social Security, uh, there are all sorts of areas where you, uh, you have pensions and uh, the, the variety of government payments that are uh, will, will tend to be adjusted for the uh, the, the, the headline CPI. And if you reduce the, the CPI reporting for the late last year, well, that means that you, from where it would have been, it means the government has to shell out less in the way of, of cash. Uh, it means they have a smaller budget deficit. Back, back in the days where uh, Newt Gingrich was trying to negotiate higher, uh, uh, or a, a greater cutback in the, in the CPI with the uh, Catherine Abrams of the uh, Bureau of Labor yeah. Statistics, According to her memoirs, he said, gee, if you could only find find your way to make these corrections to the numbers for us, we might sure. find more money for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. She didn't do those changes, but that's the type of concept that the Congress had come up with was to artificially suppress the uh, consumer inflation as reported um, with the idea of uh, reducing as a way of helping to reduce, reduce the uh, federal budget deficit without anyone having to cut back on program. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Well, John, do you think this may also be a tactic from the part of the Federal Reserve to fight inflation? Presumably, if you have a report that shows really high levels of inflation, double digits according to your estimates, then employers around the country would have to adjust for that and raise wages in the double digits every year just to keep up with inflation. Of course, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if you raise wages and the costs go up, everything else goes up in prices. And so you want to underreport to combat that rise in wages and other prices. 
Wouldn't you want to do that? Well, that, that that's that, that, that's correct, and uh, the Fed was uh, sympathetic and helpful here, at least under the auspices of Alan Greenspan. They, 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 he backed it, and he he put out similar he, he put argument he used, and again it goes against the original concept, the whole way of looking at the uh, uh, consumer price index as a way of measuring a constant standard of living. What he said was, well, uh, look um, if um, Uh, steak goes up in price people are going to buy more chicken and that may be true Uh, but that's not maintaining constant standard of living Uh the idea was to have inflation increase so that people didn't have to shift their their mode of living uh from shopping at the big private stores to the mass shopping centers because they couldn't afford the more expensive stuff at the other stores which is habit The, the the whole concept of the cpi was altered in in various stages so that right now, if you looked at it the way it had been, you'd be looking at something closer to my 15% instead of 7%. And you told me offline that 15% is not the final number. We're expecting, or at least you are expecting, an even higher inflation reading in the future, right? Well, we're in a, we're in a, uh, a period now of uh, rapidly rising inflation, and I'm not seeing any uh, signs that it's about to, about to let up. Uh, part of that's tied to the... Uh, uh, quantitative easing that the Federal Reserve has entered in, in terms of the pandemic, they didn't have too much choice in the matter. They had to they had to do something to prevent a systemic collapse. Uh, and now they're, now they're tapering, as they call it, uh, tapering their uh, monetary stimulus uh, in the next uh, couple of months. But they're still they're still buying the, uh, the still buying securities. And uh, right now, if you look at uh, what I call the basic M1, and I had to come up with that basic M1 because of some changes that the Fed made in this uh, post-pandemic crisis. Uh, as the Fed started to flood the system with liquidity, you saw a soaring growth in uh, M1, the narrowest measure of the money supply, which is basically cash and uh, uh, checking accounts, and as right. other checkable deposits were had. Uh, right. As those numbers started to spike, they redefined M1 to uh, include savings deposits which is the biggest portion of M2, the uh, the other part of the money supply as they currently report it. And that chain took the M1 component from something like 38% of M2 to uh, about 80% of M2. Uh, M2 was showing much slower growth. And the reason there is that you, you had a flight to liquidity uh, with, the, with the crisis where people moved out of the less liquid assets to the more liquid assets. They were frightened, and it's, it's still happened. Um, so with the, with the change of definition in M1, all of a sudden the soaring growth in M1 just sort of petered out because it was a different. Well, actually, actually if you look at it in terms of the uh, year to year, it was up 400% because it was against uh, the old M, uh, M1. But the, the way it was redesigned, it was, uh, it was no longer uh, uh, comparable. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, million, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany, as you can hear, and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them. And if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange. And one of the biggest are, for example, Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well-established exchanges. But, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. 
They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.